Mike muted. Muted. Oh god, it totally was muted. Rip. <laughs> oh well. Stream over. Let's start again. Hey everybody. Thank you so much for joining uh, for the first uh, beer school here on Twitch that I've ever done. Uh, my name is Andrew Mason, aka Brewer A, and joined uh, with me this week is uh, my uh, number one favorite Twitch affiliate variety streamer, Chewy Don. Oh. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, real quick. Uh, yeah, I'm a moron on the internet having a good time for everyone to see. So, hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks I, for having me. I'm, I'm very glad to have you and all of your uh, streams viewers here with us. Look at the look at the shout outs. Oh, my brother's in chat, shoots in chat. We're just blowing up left and right. Uh, so the idea here with Beer School, I've done this a number of times before um, for friends. I've brewed beer for about 12 years now, and okay. uh, a lot of people um, have very strange ideas about what beer is or how beer is made or um, what beer is all about. And so for this inaugural um, episode, what I wanted to do was like Beer 101. So we're going to go through um, the ingredients of beer, how beer is made, um, and then a little bit of Q and A if we get any from chat, and then um, hopefully if we uh, have enough uh, interest, what I want to do for this um, in future streams, and then because obviously we're on Twitch, I want to end the, uh, the stream with a little bit of um, beer and video game chat. Gotcha. So, um, so you're gonna tell me about the mash that goes into beer, right? We are. That's we are gonna be so. <laughs> First, the first thing is first, um, do you know, or can you tell me what the four main ingredients of beer are? There's Water? Only, there's only four. Water is one, and very important. Okay. Of course, when you only have four ingredients, every ingredient is important, but yeah. That's right. Water I'm is one. say grain? Grain. Uh, we'll, we'll call it, uh, yeah, grain, but in this case, we'll call it malt. And malt, we'll get, okay. We'll, get, in, we'll okay. get into the details of that a little bit later, okay. but yeah. Okay. Uh, yeast. Yeast is number three. Uh, and I'm going to guess on this one, sugar? Um, well, we're going to be getting sugar mainly from the malt. Um, but we need okay. one very special ingredient to turn all of these things into beer. Because independently, okay. uh, well, we already have yeast, but we need some, the yeast is going to turn the or the sugars into alcohol and CO2. But if we just had fermented sugar water, it would taste basically like pop. So we need one more ingredient. Okay. I'm out. Okay. I don't know. It's hops. Ah. So. Let's see. I didn't know if that was in the grain category or not. So. Oh, okay. So um, we have water, we have uh, malt, we have hops, and we have yeast. Four main ingredients. Okay. Obviously, you okay. can have lots of other ingredients to flavor and change your beer, but those are the four that you really need to have to make a beer. Okay. Excuse me. So first things first, um, I've got some pictures to explain uh, some beer. So let's let's see if this is going to work. All look, right. Look Picture at that. Time look chat. at that transition. Everything worked right away. Okay. So um, this is a uh, picture of a malt house. But actually, even before we get to the malt house, what we need to do is wow. is talk about okay. water. Let me see if I can uh, if I can navigate to water. So, uh, when it comes to water, um, water's water, right? Well, in right. This, it's it's not because, um, oh, in this case, oh, sorry, yeah, it, it's a, that was a trick question. In this case, um, let me see if I can. No, that's not it. Okay, so water. Oh, that's why because it does. You know, Windows ten <laughs> and the navigating. Okay, open with. Photo viewer. Hey man, first session. I know we're getting there. All right, let's switch over to. This is, this is a refined art. The people who do this on a weekly basis, I'll never understand because it's so many moving pieces, All so right, much you have go. to get. We're doing much better now. Okay, so um, water um, in general is not something that a lot of people consider when they're first talking about beer or thinking about beer, um, but you're. Okay hardness profile and the minerals that are in your water are going to greatly affect the way that your um, 
uh, that your end beer is going to taste. So uh, okay. when you talk about different water sources around the world, um, some very famous ones are like in England, uh, Burton-on-Trent um, is an area that has a really high calcium sulfate um, or gypsum, basically, and that changes the way the hops interact with the beer. Um, London has a really high carbonate and it ends up extracting more color from the malts. Um, Pilsen in the Czech Republic um, is a very low mineral content water. Um, and then like if you go to Munich, um, they have a different water and the alkalinity and everything else um, affects the ingredients in different ways to give you different water profiles. Uh, this image that okay. we're looking at right now is from a um, is from a book by a guy named Stan Hieronymus, who is a buddy and who is a great beer writer. He has a uh, blog um, called uh, Appalachian Beer Blog that I will actually post a link in chat if anybody would like to go see it. But he's written a number of books. Um, he's a super great guy. And this is an excerpt from a book that he wrote called um, Brew Like a Monk, um, explaining the different hardness and the different profiles from um, some different Belgian brewers. Um, some mm. very some very famous Belgian breweries, Westmall, Orval, Roquefort, uh, Chimay, Akel, West, uh, West Flatron. And you can see that these numbers are all over the place. But the reason that they ended up brewing specific kinds of beers in these areas is because their water profiles um, were just naturally in a certain way. And the kinds of beers that they would make um, or the beers that they eventually made are beers that... Um, uh, benefited from this specific water profile. So in modern times, okay. in modern times for us, this isn't super important because we can modify our water any way that we want when we brew beers. Um, we right. can we can strip, we can do reverse osmosis water, take all the mineral content out, and then um, add back whatever minerals that we want to emphasize, maybe different yeast or different hops or um, malt character. And most of that is all coming from your uh, from your mineral content and your beers. So okay. in our case, um, or in my case, uh, with the beer that I, um, that the water that we use, excuse me, the brewery that I work at comes from Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is um, a really great water source and it has um, a really nice kind of even uh, mineral content. We don't have to modify it too much when we brew um, Hey Kev. And um, um, the, the, it's the main reason why the German immigrants that came and moved to Milwaukee uh, opened up breweries in um, in Milwaukee and then around the Great Lakes area because the water is just a really great profile. Okay. So, so uh, typically now, unless you are on a well water or you have water that has just really bad character, you're not going to have to modify your water too much, um, but it is a, a very important um consideration when you're opening a brewery where you're going to source your water from. And then um, on top of that, uh, if you're going to modify it or if you want to add certain chem uh, certain um, minerals and stuff back to it, to, if you're making a specific kind of beer. And even now, um, when you go to Germany, a lot of very traditional uh, German breweries will have a picture on their label or some type of signage about how they have this amazing spring water source or they have these aquifers that are right underneath the brewery and it's a very um, old school traditional german way of or, or way of talking about their water so gotcha yeah gotcha so water is number one uh malt is number two um which you uh uh already had mentioned is grain and the main difference between the two is that grain is the um uh, is basically the form of a cereal grain when it's coming out of the field. So what we need to do to, we can't just take, thank you for the follow. Uh, what we need to do is take the uh, grain from the field and we need to turn it into malt. And the process that we're going to do that is uh, in a malt house. And the reason that we need to do it is because we can't just take raw malt and put it in the beer, the, the, um, we're not going to be able to get the starches to convert it into sugars and the yeast is not going to eat it up. So we need to take that grain and we need to get it ready for the enzymes that are naturally occurring in the grain um, to break down the starches and to turn those into sugars. Because what we're, we're basically trying to do is make sugar water, boil it, and then have the yeast eat it up. Right. So the very first thing we do um, uh, in a malt house um, is to... Uh, let me see if we can 
here's an outside picture of a mall house that I went to um, that's about halfway between Milwaukee and Madison. And I don't even know if it's actually functioning anymore, but it had functioned for a very long time um, for since the 1800s. Um, and I think it might have been sold and shut down at this point. But this was called uh, Jefferson Junction. It was an enormous malt house. Um, all of these individual uh, concrete pillars are uh, grain elevators, best, basically. So they have tons and oh, wow. tons of space. Um, and so what they do, um, they have these enormous um, vats. And what we need to do is soak the grain uh, because we're basically trying to get it ready for the germination process. So the grain goes right. into these enormous tubs, and this is um, specifically this is barley. Uh, most of the grain that makes up beer is barley, and okay. uh, malted barley makes up ninety nine or more percent of the grain that we use um, to make beers. Um, the other notable ones are generally wheat, or mm -hmm. um, for the really big breweries um, that are trying to make more lighter uh, flavored beers, rice or corn, and okay. Um, when we talk about other malted grains other than barley, we refer to them as adjuncts. So um, if you're making a uh, large malt bill um, with adjuncts, um, you're going to be using rice or corn or some other kind of cereal grain that is not barley, generally speaking. So for an example, that would be like a blue moon or something like that? Sure. Um, uh, uh, that's a, uh, that's okay. a, that's a generally speaking, that's a, um, or loosely speaking, that's a, uh, in the style of a Belgian wheat beer. So it okay. has a large portion of wheat for the malt bill. It still right. uses okay. barley and barley is going to be the majority of that. Um, but you're, uh, you're going to be adding wheat to supplement that barley to give you a little bit different of a malt character. So I see. Okay. So, um, in this, um, in this picture, this is a giant um, vat that has uh, unmalted barley in it, and it's going to get soaked with water. So here's a mm -hmm. picture of um, the barley being completely saturated and having air bubble up through it. Um, and they're trying to get it completely um, saturated uh, so that it can basically get sent to the germination phase. So once the, um, once the barley is wet and it's uh, been soaked, they get dumped out into these huge long beds and you can see this really long um, gear uh, bed along the side here there's mm -hmm. a arm that goes through and continuously rotates um, the barley and completely turns it over and this is uh, you can see it's a little hazy in this room um, it's really warm and humid and okay. we're, they're just trying to get the barley to just start the germination phase Okay. Um, so this is right. This is what it looks like when it comes straight out of those soaking vessels, and it's in big tubs. And then they have the arm come down and spread it all out and continuously turn it over. So this gets okay. uh, rotated so it's all even. And this is super, super, super long beds. So um, this is barley that has uh, just been sprouted. Um, you can see that there's uh, little um, like rootlets starting to form on it. So right when it gets to this point, you don't want it to go any farther because it's gonna to start to sprout into a plant. Um, so when it gets to this point, it goes to the kilns and we uh, halt the germination process by pushing steam through it. Um, so at this point, the barley has been malted and uh, I just squeezed one of these little kernels. You can see the starchy part um, right in the middle. Uh, the, starchy, mm -hmm. the starchy part in the middle of a, um, any kind of grain is called the endosperm. And the endosperm is what we're trying to get converted from starches into sugars. And then this is a kernel that fell out of the bed and the maltster that was showing us around was pointing out the fact that this is extremely highly modified barley, meaning that um, as soon as it gets to the germination phase, it's ready to grow. And it means that it has lots of enzymes that are in it that are um, really good for uh, converting those starches into sugars. And that's ready to go as soon as it hits germination phase. Um, and the reason that's important is that in um, uh, basically in the olden days, as it were, um, the uh, grain, a lot of brewers would actually do the malting themselves. They would get raw grain from a farmer or whatever, and they would have maltings on their pr brewery premises, and they would be in charge of turning the barley into malt. And because you had a lot less scientific control over what you were making, and you didn't have technical instruments and whatever, um, 
you would end up doing a little bit of this malting process <clears throat> in the brew house itself. And you would have to go through all kinds of different temperature steps to try to get the malt to do what you wanted. But in this case, this is modern barley that has been bred and grown in a certain way so that as soon as it's malted, it's ready to go and make beer. So okay. um, once, the, uh, once the grain is dried out, so we're gonna take it from this step, um, we're gonna take it to the kiln and we need to get all that water out of it because brewers wanna buy malt, they don't wanna buy water. So they need to take all that water out <clears throat> and they kiln it and they dry it. And then that's that very plain um, dried out uh, malt is the basis for most of the beers that are made. And this is either gonna be turned into pale ale malt or pilsner malt. And those are two very light colored, light flavored malts. So from this point, um, there are dozens and dozens of different flavors that you can get from malted barley. And in general, you're getting like bakery flavors from malt. You're getting um, toffee, bready, um, uh, toasty, roasty, nutty, chocolate, coffee. Um, all of those ca mm. characters that you might get um, come from treating base malted barley in different ways by adding different amounts of heat to it or putting it in a drum roaster or um, in some cases, they like stew it and then dry it out and you get all these different, really amazing different characteristics. And there are dozens and dozens of different kinds of malts. So okay. um, you have like, uh, you know, um, magazines and magazines of different kinds. You have caramel malts, you have um, crystal malts, you have, uh, like I said, roasted malts that can be chocolate or black or coffee flavored or brown. There's just, um, there's so much different variety that you can get from them but you're gonna be mm -hmm. getting basically bakery flavors from your malt. So once we get to the brewery, um, let me see if I can jump over to uh, a picture of what a, uh, a brew house looks like. So this is, um, this is my brew house at work. Um, we have, uh, this is actually an older photo, but right now, currently we have five brewing vessels. In this photo, we have um, four brewing vessels. So uh, the very first step is once we figured out what our recipe is going to be, we have um, uh, the, the first vessel here is called a mash kettle. <clears throat> so the mash kettle is where we're going to be um, taking all of our, our grist bill. So we look at our recipe. Um, basically, if you're going to be making like a cake, your pale malt or your pilsner malt, the pale colored stuff, is going to be the, your flour in your cake. That's going to make up the most of the recipe for your beer. And then if you want to add um, spices or color, you're going to be using a little bit amount of those specialty malts. Like a, uh, if you're going to make a stout, most of what you're using is pale colored malt, but you're going to be adding a portion of dark colored malt to give you the color and to give you the flavor. So we crush all oh. that. We crush all that up. Um, because we need to get, we need to, now that the malt's been dried back out again, it's, um, it's very crisp and dry. So we need to crack that open. We need to get to the center. Um, so we put it through a mill and, um, that also separates, um, the outside of barley, uh, kernel has a husk on it. And we're going to, we want that husk to act as a natural filter for us. So we, we crack open the grain, it gets to the starch in the middle, and it also separates the husk to basically add as a filter material. So we mix it all up in the mash kettle and depending on the temperature that you um, mix it up at, uh, the enzymes turn on automatically, their temperature activated basically. And between about 142 degrees and 165 degrees, um, they'll get turned on. And hey, Giggle, and uh, they the, the if you turn them on at a very low level, they make very simple sugars, and uh, the simple sugars. Thank you for the follow. Uh, so the simple sugars. The reason that this is important is that the yeast is going to eat up those sugars, and if you have simple sugars, it's very e easy for the yeast to eat up the sugars, and if you have uh, long chain complex, long chain complex sugars, I'm going to have to get used to hearing that follow noise in my ears and not keep talking. <laughs> so if you have long, long chain, uh, complex sugars, um, 
it's much harder for the yeast to break down all those sugars. So you end up with residual sugar in your beer, and that's what gives your beer a body. So if you mash in at a low temperature, you make simple sugars, and it's much easier for the yeast to consume all that. And um, it's going to um, uh, not leave a lot of residual sugar behind. But if you mash in at a higher temperature, you're going to make long chain sugars that are harder for the yeast to break down. And you're going to have residual sugar in the beer, mm. excuse me, that gives you your body. So if you have a beer that's really thick tasting and has a big uh, body, it's likely because there's a lot of residual sugar in the beer. So, yeah. And when you say body, you're talking like heaviness on the tongue, kind of that weighted sensation in your mouth? Yeah, basically. So Kind of if, equated to coffee? Um, kind of like if you are drinking a, um, a very simple light beer, like a Miller Lite or Bud Light or something like that. It's very mm-hmm. thin. It's very thin tasting. Um, there's not a lot of body to it, but if you mm-hmm. have a beer like Giggle mentioned, he in in uh, in chat, Giggle says, um, bottled my Baltic Porter today, one with coffee added. So uh, a Baltic Porter is likely going to be a very um, big bodied beer with residual sugar. It's going to be chewy. It's going to you're going to really know that you have something in your mouth when you're having a big bodied beer. And I see. That's all determined on the temperature that you get those starches converted uh, into sugars. And that's the most important thing that happens in the mash tun. So you're basically making um, like a big, um, uh, a big like porridge, basically. You're mixing up, okay. crush, you're mixing up crust grain with hot water and you're letting that rest so that the enzymes can turn the starches into sugars. So what we do after that is um, we ramp the temperature up because we want those enzymes to stop doing their work once they convert everything. So we heat it up to about 170 or 172 degrees. And then we push it over to the next vessel. And the next one is called a louder ton. And louder is the German word to separate. So we need to, we just mixed up this basically this like porridge, but we don't want all of those solids to get into our beer. We just want the sugar water. So we need to separate mm-hmm. the um, what is called wort, W-O-R-T, um, that's su- that sweet malty liquid. We need to separate that from the mash. So we, we use a louder ton, which if you could see a cross section of this vessel, what you would see is um, some big rakes on the inside to slowly move the grain around. And then on the bottom, there are screens that have really thin slits in them. Uh, so it lets the liquid go through, but it doesn't let any solids go through. Okay. So we mix everything up um, and we pump it over to the louder ton and the loudering usually takes uh, somewhere between an hour and 10 and an hour and a half or sometimes on bigger beers about two hours to separate all the liquid and then we also spray hot water on the top to rinse all those sugars out. So uh, uh, in about an hour and a half or two hours we've collected all of the sugar water that we need all of our wort. Um, and we're ready to boil that. So once we're done, um, all of that mash gets pumped out. Um, in our case, it goes to a farmer and he feeds it to his cows. Uh, but nice. that gets pumped out into a big vessel outside, and then that goes out yeah, to farm to pigs or whatever, and pigs or cows. And um, I remember one time actually, I was on the <clears throat> Budweiser tour um, in St. Louis, and they said something to the effect that. Uh, and Anheuser's spent grain accounts for like four or five percent of all the grain consumed by livestock in the U.S., which seems like a really <laughs> small number. But when you consider how much livestock we have and how much grain that must yeah. be, it's a pretty insane amount of uh, absolutely. Of grain. So, um, so we've separated. Uh, we've run off all of our um, wort into our kettle, um, and now we've gotten to a boil, and we need to get to our next ingredient um, because we haven't talked about hops yet. So. Mm-hmm. Hops are the uh, flowering cone of a climbing vine, and uh, they are, uh, let's see, let's, there we go. Uh, this is a, a cross section of a bale of hops. <clears throat> so um, hops grow on um, what are called vines with a B. And Mm -hmm. they uh, are green and they are leafy and they look like little pine cones, basically. I want to see if I can find a close up photo of one. You can see this. These are in a a big pile. Um, There we go. So they look like little green pine cones and they have uh, just like you get um, bakery flavors from hops. You get garden flavors from 
uh, I'm sorry, bakery flavors from malt, you get garden flavors from hops. So that can be citrusy, piney, um, uh, floral, earthy. Um, there's a whole wide range that you can get from different varieties of hops, depending on what kind of hop they are and where they were grown and the conditions that they were grown in. And there's all kinds of different factors that go into um, how they end up uh, smelling and tasting in your beer. But hops have um, essential oils and acids in them, and they are what gives your beer bitterness. So those acids that are in the beer are actually very difficult to dissolve from the hop cone into your liquid. So we boil the beer for generally an hour to an hour and a half to get that bitterness from the hops into the beer. And dep okay. depending on when you add your hops and how much bittering potential your hops have depend on when you're going to add your hops. Um, but also, in addition to the bittering component, they also have aromatic properties. But just like if you're going to make a dish at home and you're going to add spices, um, if you add all of your spices right at the beginning, it's not going to be very aromatic. Um, it's going to um, uh, all volatilize off when you're cooking your dish or boiling or whatever. So um, if you want... Uh, if you want hop aroma and flavor, you add those later in your boil so that you don't boil all of those properties off. So um, in this picture that we're looking at right now, this is um, uh, a number of years ago when I was out at uh, what we call hop selection. Um, actually, let's see, can we see crop here? So that was 2010, so that was actually a number of years ago. Um, is this uh, when you seized an underground cartel's uh, hop stash? I know, it looks like that, right? So. If you actually look at this picture right here, um, you can see that these are little pellets that look kind of like bunny food. Um, mm -hmm. The form that we primarily use our hops in are those pelletized hops. Um, they take the hops and they run them through a hammer mill and turn them into a powder, and then they put them through dyes and they put them in the little pellets. And the pellets store much better and they're much easier to use. But when we do selection, um, where, so we write contracts every year for the varieties of hops and the volume of hops that we need. But then at the, um, around September, we um, fly out to Yakima, Washington, which is where um, most of the hops in the U.S. are grown. Um, they do grow some in Idaho and they grow some in Washington State, but Yakima Valley is where they grow almost all, most of the hops in the U.S. Um, it's the high, it's wow. the high desert plain and um, it has really great growing conditions. Um, they grow all kinds of agriculture. It's actually um, second only to um, what's the famous valley in California where they grow all the food. Um, uh, I want to say Yucca. Mm, Is that correct? It's, it's like a more general valley even than that, or area. Like the agricultural part uh, of California. Anyway. Basically all of Central California. Yeah, basically all of Central <laughs> California. But Yakima is second only to that in terms of produce. They grow tons of apples there, all kinds of different fruit, grapes, but they also grow hops. So oh, wow. um, when we go to fill our contracts in the fall, uh, we will have contracts written for a certain variety. Um, you can see in this picture, this says Centennial right here. So Centennial is one of the sea hops that have generally very... Um, uh, piney and citrusy characters to it. So um, we have all of these different lots to choose from and they take um, samples from the bales of hops and give us what they would consider a representative sample from certain lots and then we evaluate those hops and rub them to choose what we're going to fill our contracts with. But when they're processing hmm. the hops, um, I think it's super cool so we can go through the processing step real quick. So out in the field uh, this is what hops look like when they're growing out in the field. So they have these really tall poles that are about 20 feet tall, and they have strings that run down, and the hops uh, grow in these, basically these trellises. And you can see the cones on the vines right there, but they have rows and rows and rows and rows of these. So uh, in the fall, once the hops are harvested, let's go back to the beginning here, um, this processing facility that we were at actually is, has a little bit older technology, and I'll show you some other newer ones too. But <clears throat> this truck has um, the guys go along and they cut the tops off of the strings, and then they just have these long strings of hops basically in the back of the truck. And then they get fed into, in this case, they tied the strings to this uh, like chain conveyor, and they get fed into the pickers, 
and in this case, the picker is kind of a, they have these fingers and they spin around real fast and they knock the hops off of the vines and then they fall down into this conveyor and the conveyor feeds up into separators because you don't want all the leaves and the stems and uh, right. the the strings and all that stuff fed into the hops. So they have these um, roll tables that spin and they tumble and um, the hop the hop cones um, are a little bit heavier so they keep falling end over end and then the leaf matter and stuff falls down and they get separated and they just go over and over and over again until it gets cleaned up. So eventually they also go to a kiln because just like um, we don't want to buy water from malt, we don't want to buy, uh, thank you for the host giggle, uh, we don't want to buy um, water in our uh, hops, but more importantly right. for hops, they're very fragile. So too much water, they will mold very easily. Um, but hops are also very dangerous because okay. if they're too dry, they often, or they not often, but they will spontaneously combust. So the moisture, what? yeah, the moisture <laughs> level is really important, and they have to uh, keep a really close eye on the moisture level during this entire process. So. If you ever, I, I know not many people ever go to Yakima, but if you ever get the opportunity to visit a hot processing facility, it's really amazing because the smell is just completely overwhelming. This, you know, it, it's almost like walking into like a weed grow because it's just, it, they smell, they're in the same family. Um, <laughs> hops are in the cannabis family. Um, but, oh, really? Uh, instead of, um, you know, cannabis sativa or whatever else, um, it's cannabis humulus lupulus. So, they're cousins, mm. basically. So if you ever get to go to a hop kiln or hop processing facility, it's really incredible because it's just totally overwhelming. Um, but they have these long beds, just like when they're making malt. Um, but they're blowing hot air up through the bottom uh, to try to dry the hops out to a very specific moisture percentage. So they have these uh, really cool conveyors that go from the pickers um, they get fed down here and then they have this arm that goes back and forth and it feeds the hops onto these beds <clears throat> and then they get dried out and it takes a couple hours and then once the hops are dried they get put into these enormous piles of hops um, and they get uh, fed into a baler which uh, this is what a baler looks like um, and this is basically a rectangle with an enormous hydraulic press on it so they get fed into here they get Smush down into these giant bales um, like this and then they get sewn up and then they can do all kinds of sampling from these bales uh, because generally speaking from the baler they go into the coolers because the pelletization process takes a long time and mostly they just want to get the hops baled and then you know later in the fall or into the winter they'll go through the pelletization process but it they it's really important just like in the grape harvest they need to get everything out of the field as soon as possible when hops are ready they need to get them out of the field and kilned and baled as soon as possible so that the um, really good characteristics that you've chosen in the field don't denigrate <clears throat> and you want to get them dried out and you don't want them to get moldy or have pests or there's all sorts of problems that can happen so hops are super fragile sure. so they yeah, want to sure. get them baled and processed as soon as possible so they have these giant uh, balers um, and then uh, this variety right here is amarillo and they have all kinds of different you know codes on it and whatever um, this picture is from a newer um, hop picker um, instead of having fingers that spin around and knock the hops, hops off, um, this is from a uh, manufacturer and a hop growing family called Peralt. And uh, this is their new picker. And it has like this, I wouldn't call it a chainsaw, but it has these teeth that move back and forth and it actually cuts the binds up into little pieces. Um, so it's a little bit, um, in their opinion, more gentle on the hop cones since you don't have something like smashing at the cones and knocking them off it just cuts them into, tumbling them yeah. around and so and they're uh they basically uh, i wouldn't say a salad spinner but they cut it into little pieces and it makes it um easier f for them to process their hops so sure and then they have this tumbler and the hops go on and the other stuff falls down and it's 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 really cool to see it's extremely loud but like i said if you ever get to see hops getting processed it's definitely something to check out but you can see these enormous like football field long um, beds of uh, hops that they're processing and they're drying them out and they've got it's extremely humid in there just like in a malt house but it's humid 
not because they're adding water, but because they've got hot air blowing up throughout and taking the, the moisture out of it. Right. So uh, this is the side view um, of that bale from, or the lot sample from the beginning. Um, you can see the compressed, uh, this is from a bale, so you can see all the cones are squished together. And this yellow stuff that's in the middle is the lupulin glands, and that's where most of the alpha acids and the essential oils are in the hot plant. And that's what gives you um, your really nice oils and the, your flavors and your aromas. So when we're <clears throat> selecting these hops, um, let's see, Giggle asks, for home processed hops, should you do something or just put it in the freezer? Um, the hops that I grow in my backyard, Giggle, uh, I pick them and I dry them on newspaper and then leave them on the newspaper for like a day or two. And as soon as they're dry, I put them in a Ziploc baggie and squeeze them as tight as I can so there's no air in them. Or you could use one of those vacuum sealers and then just stick them in the freezer and they'll keep for quite a while. Um, you can, as long as they don't get freezer burned, uh, depending on your freezer, you can have those for um, you know, a year or more. Um, professionally processed hops, you can keep in a freezer pelletized for five years or more without any kind of denigration. So uh, they last quite a while if you store them correctly. But when we're doing selection, um, the way that we do it is to take a sample of these um, of this uh, bale sample, and then you rub it in your hands um, really hard because you're heating up those oils. And then you go through and you just evaluate, just like you see Jim Cook from the Sam Adams commercials doing, where he's getting his nose in there and smelling them. You're going through all these different lots and you're smelling for um, uh, you're smelling for off flavors or for what you think is most true to the variety. Um, you want to make sure there's not like any onion garlic character in there like they were left out growing too long. It's, it, often when hops grow too long they start to get a onion or garlic or diesel character which is really unpleasant. Uh, okay. Huh. Giggle asks, how do you test your home hops for acidity? Um, there's not really a, a way at all to do it at home um, because you have to, we do it at work in the lab, but you have to use some really nasty chemicals and you have to process them in a certain way. Um, and then you have to take that and put them in a special lab instrument. So uh, yeah, Kev says just use a pool strip. Um, <laughs> so uh, at, at home, uh, there's not really a very easy way to test. Um, Generally speaking, I would say just go off of like a commercial chart and assume that your acidity is going to be a little bit lower because you're generally not, the hops that you grow at home are generally not in ideal conditions. Um, typically, I would not even use homegrown hops for bittering. I would mostly just use them for aroma because you can determine your aroma. You just rub the hop and know whether or not it smells nice. And I would use it for a late addition in a boil or for a dry hop. Um, but uh, for Bittering, I would typically use something that you buy commercially just because you can know exactly what it is. All right, so uh, if we go back to our boil, um, we've selected our hops, uh, or so we've gotten our sugar water. Let me just do a quick review. Um, we've got uh, our boil kettle filled with sugar water. Hey, Roto, thanks for saying hello. Uh, we've got a boil kettle full essentially of sugar water of our wort and it's at boil now and so we need to get our bitterness into the beer so once we reach boil we're going to add our hops our bittering addition of hops we're going to boil it for generally an hour to an hour and a half depending on your brew house and how efficient it is and um, how well it strips out volatiles and how intense the boil is <clears throat> there's all kinds of different variations of different brew houses and brewing and boil systems but hmm. like I said the hops that we're going to add at the beginning are going to be for bitterness and then um, at the very end of the boil or towards the end of the boil, um, we'll add hops for flavor um, because all that flavor won't volatilize off if it just boils for a short amount of time. And then the hops that we are going to add at the very end are going to be mostly be for aroma. And then typically from a, uh, once the boil's done after an hour, an hour and a half, you're gonna pump your, that entire volume of bitter sugar water into another vessel called a Whirlpool. And the purpose of the Whirlpool is to, which I'm not even sure if I can, if you can see it terribly well in our, in our picture, but I'll, let me pull it up real quick. Um, uh, a Whirlpool, yeah, in this photo you can't see super well, but 
um, this is our boil kettle or our old boil kettle and then there's the other vessel that's just in the background is our whirlpool and um, it doesn't have any screens or anything special in it it just um, has a inlet that is on a tangent so if you imagine um, a circle uh, your whirlpool inlet is going to come in on an angle and it's going to pump uh, the wort in and it's going to go counterclockwise and all of the proteins that are broken out during the boil and all of the hops that we've added are going to collect in the center because just like if you have like a cup of like um, coffee with loose grounds in it or tea with loose tea in it if you spin it with your spoon all of that stuff's going to collect in the center and the point of that is that we don't want all of those solids to get into our fermentation vessels which is where the beer is going to go after that and then real quick okay. giggle asks dry hop with unprocessed hops that's not turned into pellets sounds like a good idea but it's not clean clean um Generally speaking, it's not an issue because hops are bacteriostatic, which means that you can add them to anything and they're not going to grow bacteria on them. Um, so uh, plenty of breweries dry hop with whole cone hops. They're not processed in any way other than drying your beer out because hops are not going to carry bacteria with them. Um, you Typically, you need to have special equipment in the commercial scale for using whole cone hops for dry hop, but there are plenty of breweries that do it, and there are some breweries um, like Deschutes that exclusively use whole cone hops. They don't use any pelletized hops, but you have to have special equipment to handle it because the cones get stuck in equipment really easily and they don't store as well. But uh, for home, yeah, you can dump whole cones in there and it won't affect your beer negatively in any way. Uh, hmm. So if we go back to the Whirlpool, um, uh, we're, we've pumped all of our wort in there. And any proteins that have um, broken out during the boil are going to collect in the middle. And then any additional hops that we've added to the Whirlpool, um, because the Whirlpool doesn't have any heat in it. It's just a holding vessel and a resting vessel. So if we dump more hops in there, we're going to get more aroma. So uh, those, um, those hops are going to be another hop uh, aroma addition. And then generally the beer waits in that tank for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and then we're ready to pump that f um, from the Whirlpool into, excuse me, into one of our fermentation tanks. But we can't just go straight from there into the fermentation tanks. We have to cool it down. Um, and the reason is uh, because we're going to get to our last ingredient, which is yeast. And yeast um, is a living organism. It is a single-celled organism. And it does not like... Um, boiling sugar water, it will kill it. So we need to cool that down. So we're going to um, chill the wort down um, generally through some type of heat exchanger. And a heat exchanger basically just looks like a radiator that has cold water going in on one side with a whole bunch of different plates and the hot wort goes through on the other side. Oh, now Chewy's screwing with me. What are you doing with your cam? I'm sorry. Oh no. I'm sorry. Did we lose our cam? Oh no, it shouldn't have gone away. Yeah, we lost cam. See what happens when you invite a professional affiliate streamer to your unprofessional <laughs> hobby stream. <laughs> I break everything. Uh, sorry, chat. Oh, man. All right, I'm going to turn Chewie's cam off. Seriously, can you blame this guy? No, what a what a class disruptor sitting here shooting spitballs at the teacher. Patreon refund demanded. <laughs> we might I might have to uh cancel your uh your uh window and come back disconnect and reconnect reconnect. call real quick yeah hold on yeah. a second okay we're gonna come back no all right hold on just a second Hello? Not satisfied with ruining his own stream. He has to ruin other people's streams. Oh, man. That's just a curse. I ruin <laughs> everything I do. Do we have your cam back? I just see a loading window. It should be there. Oh, man. Oh, you're killing me, Skype. New voice provider confirmed. Hello? Where'd that Chewy at? 
I see it in my window. Oh man. Now we're really in trouble. Bamboozled again. I got nothing. Alright, let's try one more time. Hello, please. There's the Chewy. All right. <laughs> Let's get this reconfigured. Uh, God damn it. No more horsing around in the back of class. Sorry, Dad. I'll be quiet. All right, let's see if that works. I won't touch my computer anymore. All right, we're good. <laughs> okay. So back to the subject at hand. Yeah, pop pop quiz with a guest. Yeah, all right. So we need to we need to cool our wort down, and we're gonna pump it into a fermentation vessel, and we're gonna add the yeast. Uh, so um, and we're also gonna add oxygen because yeast needs oxygen to grow and reproduce. So um, this uh, photo right here is four uh, fermentation tanks, and you can see that they have a cone shaped bottom, and these are temperature controlled tanks. They have jackets on uh, the outside of the there's probably one jacket right up here in the middle um, that uh, controls the temperature for this area. And then there's another jacket that controls the cone temperature. And we pump um, uh, propylene glycol, uh, chilled propylene glycol through the jackets to control the temperature. And the reason is that if yeast just fermented with no temperature control, we would get all kinds of crazy off flavors and aromas and uh, it would be really unpleasant. So we have to control the temperature that yeast ferments at. And um, in terms of yeast, uh, oh, and then the reason that this is these uh, these fermentation tanks are cone shaped on the bottom is that once the yeast has done its fermentation um, and it goes dormant, it'll collect down in the bottom of those cones, and we can harvest it and use it for another batch of beer. So hmm. um, when we uh, when we talk about yeast, there are two main families of yeast. There's ale yeast and there's lager yeast. And um, the most important difference between the two of them is the kinds of flavors that you get from fermentation from the yeast. So in very general terms, uh, lager yeast is um, uh, works in cooler temperatures. It does most of its work on the bottom of the, the vessel and um, it imparts a little bit less flavor into your beer because it works at cooler temperatures. And then in very general terms, ale yeast works generally at the top of the fermentation. Um, it works at warmer temperatures and it imparts a little bit more, char or more character into the beer than lager yeast does. Um, lager yeast is from the German and Czech uh, tradition of brewing and ale yeast is from the English tradition of brewing. Um, and mainly that is because um, uh, when, you know, at the beginning of modern brewing times, they would store beer in caves in Germany um, before refrigeration. And they didn't even know what yeast was at that point, but they would make the sugar water and it would get frothy on its own by some kind of magic or whatever. And they would, <laughs> they would scoop some of that froth out and add it to the next um, beer they made and it would keep making beer. So before they even understood what yeast was, they were selecting for certain strains of yeast and wild bacteria <clears throat> just by the fact of this stuff worked and they kept doing it over and over again. And lager yeast, um, you know, they would put these beer in barrels and store them in caves and the caves would be really cool and the yeast that worked best um, in those cooler temperatures became lager yeast essentially. And then in English tradition, um, they didn't have lagering caves in the same way. They would, uh, their beers fermented a little bit warmer, and that yeast basically self-selected to be ale yeast over time. And just like hmm. with hops and just like with malt, um, there are dozens and dozens of different yeast strains, and they all do different things and behave in the beer differently. So hmm. um, if you want to think of the way that those yeasts work in a little bit different way, um, a brewer buddy of mine explained in a really, I think, really great way. If you're 
working in an office that's air conditioned um, and you can pretend like you're the lager yeast, you're in air conditioning, you're getting work done, you're typing all day long, but you're not really sweating and you go home at the end of the day and there's not really any byproducts of the work that you've done. Um, but if you are doing work out in the yard and you're mowing the lawn or whatever and you're getting sweaty and you're getting a funk worked up, the byproducts of your work are all of that BO and whatever else you've made and you're the ale yeast working outside um, and the byproduct of your work is all that other stuff that you've done. So ale yeast, gotcha. um, ale yeast, because it works at a warmer temperature, it produces esters and phenols and all these other chemical compounds um, that lager yeast will produce if you ferment it at warmer temperatures as well. But you're, those are um, in a lager, they would be non-positive flavors, and in an ale, they're positive flavors. So um, the yeast does behave differently. Um, but the most important thing to remember is that typically lager yeast is going to impart less flavor and typically ale yeast is going to impart more flavor. Um, and um, so uh, we're brewing a beer. Um, I didn't really talk about t any time scale yet. Um, typically it takes about six to eight hours from the time that you crush in your grain and get it mashed in to the time that you've boiled it and cooled in and it's fermenting in the tank. So, uh, six to eight hours to get that hot side done essentially and then the fermentation time um, is going to totally depend on what kind of beer you're making and um, and what kind of yeast you're using because those yeasts work at different times if you're making an ale um, typically that beer can be ready in as little as 15 days um, some beers are very some ales are very fast excuse me if you're making a lager uh, those beers typically take longer like four to six weeks because the lager yeast works different and it takes longer to break down um, uh, the sugars and to break down the other uh, chemicals and compounds and stuff during fermentation. So uh, mm. beers um, anywhere between 15 days to six weeks, depending on the kind of beer you're making. Um, if you're going to want to have a beer that has a really big hop aroma, like you're typically if you're making an IPA or a double IPA or some kind of beer that when you drink it, you're just like, holy shit, this has an incredible amount of hop aroma. Um, you're going to uh, wait until the majority of that fermentation is done. You're going to harvest your yeast either to use in another batch of beer or to dump down the drain. And then um, you're going to basically climb to the top of one of these tanks and you're going to um, uh, just dump a whole bunch more hops in the top and seal the whole tank up and then the hop, the tank, the beer is going to rest on those hops for another five or seven days depending on um, your preferred method um, and then you're going to crash cool that beer uh, cool it down to almost freezing you know a little bit above freezing and then either um, move it to a, a packaging tank um, or you're going to filter it if you're a brewery that filters their beers, or you're going to centrifuge it um, if you're a brewery that uses centrifuge um, to get all of the yeast and everything out. Um, but uh, generally that's done on day five to day seven, depending on the kind of beer you're making, and that'll give you a really big hop aroma. Um, and then mm. you're going to want that beer to condition for a little bit. Um, uh, in ales, typically they don't need to condition for very long. They're typically ready to drink much sooner. But if you're making a lager, it's going to take, um, like I said, four to six weeks typically um, for that conditioning process to happen and for the flavors to mature and to even out. And then Giggle, hmm. asked, Giggle says, most of the times I brewed with different yeast, it mostly said to keep the fermentation to about 19C for the first part. And 19C, I want to say, is about 70 degrees. Uh, let me just check the Googles real quick. 66 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, Giggle, it's totally dependent on the yeast strain that you're using and how much temperature control you have. Uh, because um, during the first little window of time, like the first maybe 12 hours, typically your yeast is not going to be throwing off any esters that would be indicative of a warm, really warm fermentation. So if you're making a lager, you can do that first little window um, warm and then cool it down to your fermentation temp, which is typically uh, for lagers, I'm going to say it's about 10 C, yeah, 10 to 12 C, which is about 50 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you ferment warmer than that with almost any lager yeast, you're going to get um, esters and phenols that you don't 
want in your beer. They're going to be not flavor positive. So, uh, yeah, depending on how much temperature mm-hmm. control you have, you can start warm and then cool down. Um, and then uh, it just uh, depends on how much temperature control you have, really. If you're making an ale, uh, we ferment most of our beers at 67 degrees, which is 19 C, 19 and a half C. Um, so just it, it's completely yeast dependent. Um, just depends on what you're doing and what kind of characteristics you want in the end. There's not there's not one universal rule of thumb with yeast yeast handling. So so the beers in the ferment the beers in the fermenter. If you've dry dry hopped it, it's going to age on those hops for a couple more days and get a big hop aroma. Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna want to separate out any hops that you've put in the tank, any residual yeast that's still in suspension in the liquid, um, or any other proteins or anything that have broken out, because we don't want to drink. Generally speaking, we don't want to drink really hazy, chunky beers. So we want to get those solids out of our beers. So some breweries will filter where they pass a beer through some type of filtration, either a membrane or they use screens that are loaded up with diatomaceous earth, which is basically like crushed up seashells in, or a synthetic version of it. Um, mm. And then uh, some breweries like our brewery uses a centrifuge, which just spins the beer to separate um, the proteins and all that other stuff. Uh, and the philosophy behind it is that we just spent all of this time getting these amazing aromas and flavors into the beer. If you filter, you're also going to be filtering out some of those flavor and aromas. There's no getting around it. Of course. So, of course. Um, if you centrifuge, you're not passing the beer through a filter, and you're just spinning off the solids. Um, so, some people um, prefer that method, which in our case we do because there's higher yield out of the tanks than using a filter. And then there's also um, less flavor and aroma loss. Um, but you want to get all those solids out of the beer because you want to have a bright beer, generally speaking. Um, mm-hmm. This picture that I just threw up is some of the outdoor fermenters at New Belgium in Fort Collins. Um, those previous pictures that we saw are um, about a 15 barrel tank. So you can think of that as like 30 kegs. These are, I think, 800 barrel fermenters. So obviously sig- significantly bigger, um, but they are still um, conical tanks. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see from this angle, but these diagonals right here are the bottoms of those mm-hmm. cones that we just saw. Um, but the scale is obviously enormous. So still cone shaped tanks, but they're just a lot different scale than something much smaller like this. But the, the overall geometry is about the same. So, mm-hmm. um, so now we have bright beer, um, how do they control the fermentation temps in those big silos? They're temperature controlled um, in just the same way that the small tanks are, but they just have much, much bigger um, jackets on the outside. So instead of having little tiny zones that control it, um, these the jackets are just much bigger and they um, surround the entire outside. And, you know, this outside is, these are outside tanks. So this is cladding and, you know, weatherproof material for the whatever, so it doesn't get damaged. But there's jackets on the inside of this that control the temperature with all kinds of probes and stuff, because that's a enormous volume of beer and you can't have all that, you know, fermenting at crazy temperatures. So, um, what else? So packaging. So, uh, the beer is packaged, um, and depending on, you know, what you're making, uh, it's either going to go into kegs or into bottles. Um, so from whatever your next step past your clarification step is, either filtration or um, centrifuging or, you know, many breweries don't do any kind of clarification. They just let the beer sit in the tank for a while and all those solids will eventually settle out. But they go to a packaging tank or a bright tank, um, different name for it. Um, and uh, the beer generally gets carbonated in that tank. So there's um, some type of um, either ceramic stone or sintered steel, something that can make tiny little bubbles um, go into the beer. Um, and you bubble CO2 through there, and uh, that adds the carbonation. Um, and uh, that's how you get your bubbles into the beer. Um, the yeast is producing CO2 as a byproduct of fermentation, and sometimes you can capture that. Um, and have the natural carbonation in the beer. 
but depending on your processing, like if you filter a carbonated beer, it generally doesn't filter very well. So um, in some cases it's not uh, practical to capture that. But if you have like a Belgian style beer that is carbonated in the bottle, um, that's, uh, they'll generally take that yeast that fermented the beer out, add a tiny little bit of sugar back and add a little bit of yeast back and then put it in the bottle. And then it ferments, it does a tiny little fermentation in the bottle. And that carbonation is what gives you your bottle conditioned beers. Were you going to ask me something? Oh uh, yeah. Like what, I mean, if, if you have the experience, like what is the flavor difference between, uh, a beer that has been bottled with its, I guess, grown in? carbonation versus a beer that had carbonation added to it um like, is there a significant or generally speaking it's not so much a flavor difference but it's a fineness of the bubbles um, natural carbonation because the carbonation is literally coming off of a yeast cell um, it gives you extremely fine tiny little bubbles and natural mm. um, when you force carbonate a beer um, there's not really a way to get that same fineness of uh, carbonation in the beer so the bubbles tend to be a little bit coarser a little bit bigger sometimes they'll dissipate a little bit more easily um, once you've opened the beer but a bottle conditioned beer um, if you crack that open and pour it into a glass you're going to have extremely fine um, tiny little bubbles that often last a very long time and forced carbonated beers are just a little bit bigger bubbles and they're not as delicate that's the main difference. Would you say that. it's almost like a, a condition like champagne, kind of? Yeah, because champagne is conditioned in the bottle. Um, so you get those tiny, very fine bubbles. Oh. Um, and um, uh, mostly in bottle conditioned beers, you're going to be having like a Belgian style beer. Um, it's not going, there's not a, a ton of, um, uh, there's not a ton of non-Belgian style beers that are bottle conditioned. It's mostly for extremely fancy style beers, but um, the, there's it's mm -hmm. a it's a it's a lot more work to do that, and there's a lot more variables, so you don't see it as frequently. But it's not very difficult to find a bottle conditioned beer. It's just for certain. It's typically for certain styles. Sure, sounds uh, fancy. It is, and then. Um, if you're not going to bottle your beer, either the beer gets put into a bottle or um, it generally gets put into a keg. Um, those are the two main ways of packaging your beer. Um, and then, for, you know, a keg is going to either go to a draft system like at a bar or a party or whatever else. But those are the two main ways to package your beers. Um, and then, yeah, you've got your, that's pretty much beer from start to finish. So it's once it's packaged, it's ready to be consumed. Jeez. I know. What a, what a lesson. What about? I don't was, see any. That was quite a lot of info. I don't see any more um, questions right away from chat. Um, I guess if you guys have anything else before we jump over to the um, small little beer and video game section that I have to add, uh, I'll give you guys just another second. Otherwise, we'll transition over. Um, obviously, this is on Twitch, and Twitch more than anything is about video games, which it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Indeed. Let's see. Let me switch our tabs. Oh, you know what? I had this video queued up and I forgot to show it. Sorry, class. Here's a video of um, kind of a hard to see video, but this is a brewery mashing in. So there's hot water dumping in and there's grain being dumped in and it's getting s stirred up together. I thought I'd show it, but I totally forgot to bring that video up. But it basically looks like mm -hmm. a giant vat of hot oatmeal. So. <laughs> but if I switch over here, so I alluded to this last night when Chu and I were playing Overwatch, but um, for a company that is detailed, uh, as detailed driven and detailed focused as Blizzard. Oh yeah, no, Brewer was fucking furious about this last night. I, I don't understand this setup in the spawn. So this is the spawn map in Eichenwald. Um you're in a beer hall, basically, and they have what I can only assume are these brewing vessels. But the brewing vessels, to me, don't make any sense at all. And I don't, I can't get why Blizzard did this. So, first of all, they all have stacks, which totally makes sense, which is that central part where your exhaust is going to go. But then they have these secondary um, stacks on the side with pressure gauges, which doesn't make any sense at all because these are not pressure vessels 
you, you can't have a pressure on your mash. You can have a little bit of rack pressure on a mash or on a boil kettle, maybe, but it's not super practical. And they have three of these vessels and they're identical. Like the, the stacks are slightly different on one, but it's three of the exact same vessel. So it just, it doesn't make any sense. And in the exceedingly rare chance that anybody from Blizzard ever sees this video, maybe I'll get an answer, but they do such a great job on so many things. I just, I didn't understand why they wouldn't just ask a brewer, like the, the simplest question. <laughs> with like, hey, with all these... the craft breweries in yeah. California too, you would think that. Did these three vessels, do these three vessels make any sense at all? Like, no, no guys, no, they really, they really don't. Like, even if they were stills, they wouldn't be pressure vessels like that. So that's my, that's my tiny little beer and video game. Uh, t uh, chat for the for the beer school um <laughs> the um the one thing that i really hope that we can do when we do this uh i hope next time let me see if i can pull this up is this gonna work for us rip my phone's not even broadcasting now mirror link connected wow. are we good well oh what? the darkness right. takes us chat I know. Let me try, let me try to pull this back up. I thought my mirroring was working, and it was working so well last time. I had it all worked out. Do not, do not be afraid, chat. We are with you. Um, yeah. See, we're back. Okay. No, I don't care about that. Rip. I opened up the free version instead of the paid version. Rip. Pro. Let's get that going. Oh, so the joys of streaming. <clears throat> there's um there's this really great um uh there's this really great uh app called Draft Lab. And it is a joint um tasting app basically. Mirroring is paused. I don't want you to pause. I want you to mirror. Do my mirroring for me. Do it. Just, just talk dirty to it. I know. I don't want you to stop. I want you to go. Nope. Rip. Come on. Come on. Come on. Do it for me. <laughs> Do it. Do it. Man, this is a bummer. Don't be afraid, chat. I totally had this working before. Try, there, oh, um... there we go. There we go. We did it. Oh, okay. Let me switch over. Okay, so um, this is uh, a, a app called Draft Lab, and it is developed by a friend of mine that works at uh, New Belgium. She um, started this with um, uh, somebody else, and it is for evaluating beers. So if this is the beer one on one class, mm -hmm. um, what I hope to do in the future is to get like maybe like three beers that are easily available that whomever else wants to join in, uh, Chewy, if you come back and do this again, or whomever mm -hmm. comes and does this with me, we'll get three beers that we can just go to the store and buy. And I will walk um, you guys through how to do a beer evaluation. So it's not about like rating beers, it's but it's about how to taste beers and how to evaluate beers. And this app is a really cool way to do this. Um, so let me pull a, uh, a version of this up. So um, what happens is you come up with um, a beer. We'll just call it beer XYZ for right now. And it will give me a code. Um, and I share the code with everybody. And for this one, the code's going to be AA, uh, looks like, zero z three and so everybody opens their app and they put in this code and it pulls everything together and then um you get to just go through all of the different parts of the beer and evaluate what it is so if you're looking at your beer and you want to pick the color there's a nice little slider bar that you just move back and forth and say yes it's either this or no it goes all the way down to here very black opaque and it's, it's super easy to use. 
and I've used this app before with a beer school with some friends that have never used it before and they all found it super intuitive and easy to use. But um, the thing that I think is really great about it is beyond the very basic stuff like color and whatever else, um, I find that a lot of people have a very difficult time expressing what they like in a beer or don't like in a beer and um, adjectives and ways to say something other than like, I just don't like it or it sucks or it tastes like butts or whatever else. So mm -hmm. um, if you pull up aromas, you have all of these different categories that come up that you can choose from that are potential like families of aromas that you can experience in a beer. So we were talking about um, a dry hop being a really big hoppy um, aromatic properties. So what are those aromas? Are they fruity? Are they spicy? Are they burnt? So if we go into fruity, there's all this other stuff that you can pick. It can be tropical fruit. It can be berry. It can be coconut. It could be a pear, some other kind of stone fruit. Um, and you just go through and click whatever ones that uh, you think that it tastes like. And then it generates all of these different characters and aggregates them so that once everybody has gone through and tasted the beer, we get this really cool map um, that everybody can look at that uh, you know describes aromas <laughs> and tastes and mouthfeels. So those ripe options, though, I mean, that sewage beer looked awful delicious. <laughs> uh, I've tasted sewage characters in beers before, and it is not pleasant. Um, <laughs> so it definitely comes up, but. Um, I think this is a really cool way to um, uh, to not only get people to understand what they're tasting and, and smelling in beers, um, but just a really cool educational tool. And we actually use the um, professional version of this at work when we're evaluating beers. So it's a really cool tool and it's free. Mm. And um, so the next time that we do beer school, uh, my intention is to get everybody to download this ahead of time. Um, and we will, I will publish what beers that we're going to try way, way ahead of time. So everybody has a chance to get them at their local store or whatever. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll do a, uh, you know, a joint tasting and evaluation of the beers. And, um, I think it will be really cool and hopefully people will be into it. Sounds like good fun. Anything else that I that I forgot? I, I realize that went a little bit longer than what we intended, but uh, uh, I'd I'd let people know where they can find you and get more information about beer school ahead of time. Yeah, we can definitely do do some shout outs. Um, you want to go first, and then I'll wrap it up for us. Oh sure. Uh, my name's Chuyidon. I'm a variety broadcaster here on Twitch. Makes more on myself. A lot of my fam here in the chat. Thank you for supporting one of our fellow friends. I hope you guys enjoy beer school. Uh, thanks for having me. There's a lot of great information, cleared up some of my misconceptions about how brewing is, and very interesting just coming from the coffee industry and being involved in coffee for a long time, the the similarities uh, and flavor profiling and all that kind of stuff. So just cool experience. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for coming. Um, if you guys are interested in beer school and you dug it, um, you can follow me on Twitter at brewer underscore A, uh, here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash brewer A. Um, and I will, I think the best place for me to post beer school information is going to be on my Twitch page, um, in the details, uh, in the bio and I'll post all the stuff there. So if you're looking for it, um, hopefully we can pick another date sometime soon and, uh, get some people involved and I think it'll be really fun. So sounds great. All right. Thanks again. Thank you guys. We will, uh, I'm going to switch over. I, Chewy, I assume you're going to jump in and do some streams tonight. Yeah, there'll be some streaming going on tonight, so I'll probably uh, figure out.